Now we have um, what we are calling them as ordered pairs and the next step that we're going to do is we're going to put them into a coordinate pair. So for example, let's say I have a bunch of ordered pairs, um, say 1, 3, 2, 7, negative 1, negative 4, 1, no, 1, um, 4, negative 2. Now the ordering here says that that's these are all the first entries, right? So just so you remember, these are the first entries, which were also the domains, which we were also referred to as inputs. Okay, and then you have the second entries which we refer to as range, which were further referred to as outputs. Now, in this chain of definitions, we're gonna add one more. We are gonna use x to be the variable for input or domains or the first entries, and y to be the variables for outputs or ranges or second entries. Now, this is a completely arbitrary notion. However, there is some sort of logic in it in the sense that you expect inputs to precede output meaning the input comes first and output and so there's an alphabetic order between x and y okay now once that is defined all we have to do is we take two number lines and place them orthogonally meaning at 90 degrees and we arbitrarily call this x which corresponds to the first entry domain inputs, right? And we call this the y-axis, which corresponds to the second entry in the ordered pair, the range, output, you know, all these are synonymous terms. Um, so in your head, whenever you hear one of them, you should sort of visualize the remaining. Now, it's a number line, so let's just label them. Um, you know, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 7. Now let's, let's locate them. <coughs> okay, so the first one says, the first entry is 1, so that means the x value is 1, that's right here, and I go, I go right by 1, and I go up by 3, so that's right there. Yeah? That's 1, comma 3. The second one says it's 2 and then 7. Then I have a negative 1 and a negative 4. And then I have a 4 and a negative 2. Okay, if I were to label them, this would be 1, 3, 2, 7, negative 1, negative 4, 4, negative 2. So what this has given me is another way to view this function uh, as these points on the plane, on the coordinate plane. And it gives me further another way of listing the domain and the range. Remember, this the first input and the first, sorry, the first entry and the second entry basically values for x and y. Now, the upside of this is that if I can, so that's another idea in mathematics is if you go from <coughs> one representation to the other, um, then you can also come back from this other representation to the first one. So by moving back and forth between representations, you can always gain more information. For example, now let's say, instead of having you draw the graph, I give you a graph. I give you a graph and the graph is something like this. Um, it starts at zero and it ends at one. Okay, so this point here is one comma zero, and this point here is zero comma one. And this purple line, that's the function. Okay, um, okay I'm going to remove this dotted line to avoid confusion. That's the function. Now, the question is, what information can you derive of, about this function? Right? So basically what this says, that's my input and that's my output. So let's say I want to find domain. All I'm looking for is 
what are the inputs that are possible so just by looking at this diagram i can see that the inputs are between zero and one yeah so i'm going to write these as words for now between zero and one and the range is also between zero and one okay so um now over here we actually made a pretty um a big jump at a theoretical level but however we won't be discussing that because what we made the jump that we made is from earlier we just had finite number of points we just had pairs of points but here now we have this sort of an inf infinitely many pairs that we have in introduced but um don't worry about that yet um um, this example is just to illustrate that going in the in the reverse direction then you can just read graphs and tell things about domains and ranges now because we have this input output um, relationship in the functions um, we can evaluate functions at a given input for example <clears throat> let's say so now here I'm going to introduce a algebraic notation for writing a function. So here how this is read is x is the input. f of x is what the function throws out when you get the input. So it is the output. So it, there are two representations. You can write output as y, but you can also write it as f of x. Now for us y and f of x are synonymous but the reason we have two notations is you can have functions which with more than one variable right in which case maybe y is part of an input and the output is z or you have multiple variables and that's why the notation f of x is a more um, robust notation in terms of extending it to further diff multiple inputs and all so what evaluating function means is you're basically trying to find if x has certain values, then what is f of x? Okay, so for example, if I say evaluate f at x equals 1, negative 2, 7, and a. So this is what I'm going to do. Now, if x is 1, I just replace x by 1, right? So f of 1 is going to be 1 plus 1, which is 2. If x is negative 2, I replace x by negative 2. So negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. If x is 7, I replace x by 7. So 7 plus 1 is 8. Now the last example, x is a. I just replace x by a. So this is a plus 1, which cannot be further simplified just because a is just a number. Right? It, it doesn't matter what it is. So I guess let's look at more examples of this. If I have x squared plus 1, then what is f of a? All I do is I replace x by a, so it's a squared plus 1. What is f of h? h squared plus 1. What's f of a plus h? Now this is an important one. Question is, is f of a plus h equal to f of a plus f of h? Yeah, the answer is almost never. Yeah, so that's never going to be true. So, for example, in this particular case, f of a plus h means now I replace x by a plus h. So this is going to be a plus h squared plus one. <coughs> Not a squared plus h squared, but a plus h whole squared, which is a squared plus 2ah plus h squared plus 1. So when you're finding f at some abstract value, all you're doing is you're replacing the x by that particular value. So that's in the algebraic notation. Um, what about graphically? Graphically, let's say, um, this is my function that's given to you. 
say find f of 2. So what do I do? When you're finding f of 2, first of all, you have to isolate what these things mean. What is the input? The input is 2, and then you recall that that means x equals 2. Now on this coordinate plane, you find out where is x 2. That's 1 and 2. x is 2 right here. Right. So once you have this x2, you draw a vertical line at 2, at x equals 2. So you go vertically up until you meet the function. Yeah. So you see where, this where you meet the function? And that is going to be the output. So if this is 2, this value here is going to be f of 2. Right? Why? Because x comma f of x is an ordered pair. Take a minute to unpack what this means. This says that when the input is x, the output is f of x, which is literally the definition of a function. So for any point on any function, if you have to say find f of 7, then this is 7 comma f of 7. And to read it from the graph, you go vertically up and then you go into the y-axis. So that's the bit about evaluating functions. Okay, this video has already run over almost 12 minutes. So I'm going to pause and make another one.